This season, we've been talking a lot about climate change. Maybe you can tell that our little podcast team has it front of mind, but we also wanted to know how you're thinking about these issues. Okay, it is a windy day on campus. This is Jenny Cunningham. And to do that, producer Jenny Cunningham visited the University of British Columbia to ask an important question. I'm going to go around and ask students how they feel about the climate crisis. Um, So would you please share your name and uh, what your feelings are about the climate crisis? Hi, my name is Adam. When I think of climate change... Oh, man. As you can hear, it's a big question. And the enormity of this collective global crisis can be even harder to reckon with. You get a lot of information saying that we're already doomed and kind of making people feel like lost at hope. I feel really sad thinking about the climate crisis because of like all the consequences to people and animals and stuff. It feels like a very large problem that I as like one person can't do very much about it. But at the same time, there's optimism. So you're hopeful. I would say that I'm hopeful that, um, and I'm not sure how human civilization will move forward, but I know that it will. Governments, countries, and everybody's individuals that sort of all need to step up in order to fix it. There are so many actions that we can take, ranging from small steps. We can start backtracking. We can find new solutions to problems. To some suggestions that are more, let's call them giant leaps for humankind. So we're able to do like pretty crazy things like go to space or like like build on a monumental scale. With so many potential paths, where should we go? How can we begin to repair what feels like it's already broken? Like going to Mars and colonizing somewhere else? Hill I will die on all day. <laughs> that is not an option. It is a distraction and it's working and I think it's a false flag. We waste time talking and money on trying to colonize Mars that like we probably could have just electrified our grid and set ourselves up like really well. You're listening to Nice Genes, where we peek into the world of genomics, sponsored by Genome British Columbia. I'm your host, Dr. Kaylee Byers, and though we're definitely not going to Mars, this episode is going to be out of this world. This is part two of our look at the climate crisis, repairing the environment. Previously, we explored how scientists and researchers are looking to prepare the planet for a future facing more severe climate events. In today's episode, we're looking at the impacts that people have already had on the environment and asking, can we fix it? How's it sounding? It's sounding incredible. <laughs> That's Aria Han. Thank you. She's a scientist and the founder of Kunki, a biotechnology research company. It's very niche. We work with the DNA data from microbial communities. We really like what we call weird and wonderful communities and places and how they interact with one another. Let's come together on a, on a, a very simple question. I'm sure you'll have a very straightforward answer to. Um, can we solve climate change? What do you think? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yes, I, I think we can. Will we is a different question, but I, I think we can. If we want to do it quickly and immediately and in big strokes, it has to be a fundamental shift in how we're living. We have to do more things local. We can't mass produce. We can't get everything for the cheapest possible dollar all the time that breaks immediately. It's just not gonna work. Cars are not the problem. Plastic bags are not the problem. The US military is a huge contributor to climate change. We don't talk about that, but we put the personal responsibility on individuals. I don't think that's where it needs to be. I think it needs to be at these much broader scale things. Now, that's probably unrealistic. So more likely, I think it's gonna have to be a collection of new technologies, not a single silver bullet, but reductions everywhere and a combination of these technologies so that we can keep a standard of living. Because I don't want it to sound like you have to give up everything. Like, no, you don't. But maybe you have to give up owning 300 shirts instead of 30 shirts. (laughs) And and so, you know, there's going to be some kind of balance there, but it's not going to be this awful thing where you don't have cars and you don't get clothing and you can't watch television and you can't heat your home. Like, no, that's not what we're talking about. While working in the world of genomics, Arya came across a fascinating realization about microbes. 
I think they're going to save us all. I think that's, I, uh, it's like probably high hyperbole, but not. I went to university, I started in business and I hated a couple classes. So I switched over to the only science program that I could do, which happened to be renewable resources. Like literally no better thought than that. I was 21, I was not ready to get a job at all. And I had a, a prof in soil science who said, hey, do you want to do a master's? And I was like, yeah, sure. Like more of school sounds fine. And you're going to pay me to do this. Like great, I have to get a job and I know how this life works and I'm pretty happy. Microbes are in a lot of ways the stewards of Earth, uh, of all life on the planet. They protect us. So you have way more microbial cells than human cells. You have way more microbial genes than human genes, for sure. You only have like 22,000 human genes, right? Like it's like not that many. So there's lots of things you can't even do as a functioning human without microbes. So there's absolutely everywhere. Often I think they get a bad rap. It's like, oh, they're germs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Most of them, you totally need them. They're living on your skin and your skin would not, you know, function without them. So all, all sorts of these things. Even beyond us, microbes created the climate that allows us to live here. They control everything. They are the ones that are cycling nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and, and they're transforming the elements that we're using and everything that functions on this planet. You gotta run that through a microbe. They really are the creators of the world that we are able to inhabit. In your body, you have 10 times more microbial cells than human cells. Think about that for a second. So much of you is microbe. In the media, we often frame microbes as germs or bacteria that we should avoid. Disease germs are dangerous because they make you sick if too many of them get inside of you. And even in our last episode on spotting diseases, we mentioned how ancient pathogens can be locked away in remote regions, and that those microbes, well, they could have the potential to infect people. But there's still very little we know about these little guys. And using advancements in genomic technology is revealing how certain microbes have enormous benefits. That's why Aria believes that we should embrace them. Doing so may just be what we need to reverse some of the damage that's already been done. How can microbes then bring us into a, a healthier environment or how can we use them to create a healthier environment given that we're dealing with you know, the impendingness of climate change? There's a lot we know about them, but we are, we are just scratching the surface. Every single sample we're taking, we're discovering novel species, novel genre, novel, sometimes families, like just, there's a lot of discovery that needs to happen. And for a long time, we thought, oh, there are limits to life. And there are, but every time we're looking for these limits to life, and we're doing this in Antarctica, we're doing this in extreme places on, on Earth, cool environments, we're like, no, this is going to be dead. Uh, there's probably a microbe that lives there. So you can get microbes from basically anywhere from Antarctica, from Hawaiian lava tubes, from deep mines, from old rocks, from really hairy problems where, you know, the chemical load would suggest that this thing is so toxic, nothing lives there, but like microbes do. I think we can start to put them to work. We already know of microbes that degrade uh, hydrocarbons, so oil spills, gas spills. And so there are technologies we can use to enhance the activity of those microbes to degrade it more quickly and do that kind of cleanup work. Forest fires are obviously a big deal in BC. California is on fire. If we're going to recover from that, I think that we're going to need microbial support in regenerating those forests and getting that ground cover on there so that you don't see what happened in BC last year. The roots from these trees are supposed to hold the dirt in place. Where you have this forest fire and then... That layer of protection is removed, making major floods and mudslides more likely. Because there's no vegetation to hold that up anymore. And so we need to get that vegetation reestablished, keep that moisture in to prevent further drying, to prevent mudslides and all of those things. And plants on their own don't do a lot, just like you on your own don't do a lot. Not to pick on you, Kaylee, but like, you no, know. That's fair. No, you're right. You, you know, like <laughs> you, you, you need this whole support team and the microbes really are that support team. And so I think there's going to be technologies of like quick vegetation where it's like, yeah, that burnt down. We got to get stuff back on there so that we don't have problems for the next 10 years microbes are gonna to have to play a key part in things like that.
Yeah, that's really interesting. So you're really talking about how do we heal heal harms to the environment and what role yep. might microbes play go places that people can't necessarily get with their I don't know how you clean up an oil spill honestly yeah have you done those experiments as kids where you get this water dish and then they pour oil and they give you like q-tips and you're just trying to clean it up and you can't do it it's like yeah what you need is a biofilm on there right 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 yeah like when a bunch of microbes are all smushed together to the surface of the spill yeah, exactly that's the biofilm yeah to just like eat all of that and transform it it's the only way it's gonna work okay well now i know in, in your dish <laughs> in your like grade four science experiment yeah, plaque on your teeth i think are also a biofilm which are yeah you know that's nice and gross <laughs> no 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 it's super cool i love <laughs> gross things yeah perfect <laughs> don't you just love the stuff we learn when we're kids captain planet oh yes i would oh big time i won't miss it the power is yours So if microbes hold a key to creating a more sustainable future, where might they be needed the most right now? If we picture what building a cleaner future looks like, it's not quite the idyllic green landscape with little gadgets and gizmos cleaning up after us. The truth is, at least for the immediate future, it mostly sounds a little like this. A sustainable future is shaping up to look a lot like how it does now. It's loud. It's busy. To make clean wind farms, we have to drill into the ground to erect towering structures to capture the breeze. To harness renewable energy, we dig deep and extract rare minerals that produce long-lasting batteries for cars and solar panels. These big projects aren't likely to end in the immediate future. So folks like Aria are putting microbes to work helping mitigate the environmental disruption these activities cause, such as mining. So one area that you've done some work is in this mining space. You were talking about, you know, environmental harms. We often hear about mining runoff, right, and and the environmental harms it can do. What role do microbes play in, in the mining industry? One of the things that's super exciting about the mining industry is that they are investing a lot in microbial technologies right now because they feel like the chemical and physical solutions that they have, they kind of limit it out. So microbes are on mines throughout the entire life cycle. There's some early evidence actually that suggests that taking samples of rather surficial soils, like the top couple meters, where you don't need a big drill to get super deep, you could like use a shovel, the microbes in there might actually be indicative of some of the minerals or value add materials that are below. And then as you go through the mining cycle, so yes, you know that you have a deposit of something of interest here. And so it's either this open pit mine where you're digging this big hole, or there's these underground mines. Essentially, when you dig really big holes, we're talking like kilometers deep, you're exposing things that have not been exposed to oxygen or rain and water and all sorts of different elements and, you know, potentially millennia. Uh, and, And so you get all of this new microbial activity where you might find that there's natural amounts of selenium in a rock. It's an element, and all of a sudden you're digging these big holes and you're crushing these rocks, and so that rate of selenium leaching increases such that it becomes really toxic. Those processes can be slowed by microbes, or the microbes can be used to kind of transform that selenium into things that aren't toxic and aren't harmful before they hit waterways and affect wildlife and, and you know downstream life. So I'm, I'm hearing sort of three pillars of where microbes might be involved. One is that it could actually help direct you to where you would dig. So you reduce excess digging in areas where you wouldn't want to dig otherwise. Yes. You will learn new things about those microbes once you've uncovered them through these digs. And we might learn interesting things there. And then they can help mediate some of the potential harms that come with mining. Yeah. And they're already used in a lot of wastewater treatment, tailings treatment. So... And then the last step, I guess, is mine closure. We've got everything out there. We've removed the immediate risks of, you know, selenium leaching in or our acid, you know, from the mines is one of the other big things we hear about a lot. And now we want to plant trees and get this this habitat back to what it was before. And I think microbes are really essential in that reestablishment piece as well. Right. So it's converting the old into sort of the new the climate future of that of that space. Yeah, this is where we should be using the word terraforming. Like not in the, not in the context of Mars <laughs> because again, hill I will die on. Yeah. But in in this idea of you've dug a big hole and you want a forest and deer and you know everything bugs living there again. 
microbes can help terraform in that sense. These tiny microbes could be huge healers of environmental harms. As Arya mentioned earlier, if we're going to save the planet, it isn't going to be a single silver bullet solution. So what are some of the other weird and wonderful tactics wiggling around out there? You're listening to Nice Genes, a podcast all about the fascinating world of genomics and the evolving science behind it, brought to you by Genome British Columbia. I'm Dr. Kaylee Byers, your host, and we want to get more people listening to the genomic stories that are shaping our world. So if you like Nice Genes, hit follow on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows. Help your inner microbiome flourish by spreading the microbe love with your friends. Hi, Chris. Hi, Kaylee. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for having me. That's Chris Rinke. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Queensland and... I work with uh, microbial genomics, microbial ecology, and, well, recently my lab got really interested in the microbial plastic degradation. A while back, Chris and his wife were sailing the Pacific Ocean when they came across something that would put their lives on a different course. My wife and I decided to take some time off. We had an old sailboat that we fixed up the years before and we decided to, to sail to Mexico. We started from San Francisco, went under the Golden Gate Bridge, turned left, sailed to Mexico, kept going all the way across the Pacific and eventually ended up in Australia. But we could visit the beautiful places along the, along the route. And one of them was in the Tuamotos and that's uh, many coral atolls, uh, many uninhabited islands. And we stayed on one of them for over a week and it was, it was beautiful, gorgeous. It was pretty much like you would envision paradise. But there was some plastic debris there, so we decided then, well, we should clean it up and made it up with two large garbage bags full of plastic debris, plastic waste. And that was very concerning because that island is, is uninhabited and it's about more than 2,000 kilometers away from, from, any, uh, from mainland, but plastic still made it there. And when I then arrived in Australia, I wanted to look into that a little bit more and being a microbiologist, it was the next step to see if can do anything about microbes and research microbes that involve plastic degradation. Being an enterprising scientist, Chris took the path of so many scientists before. He looked at these plastics and asked a question. How can we deal with the issue of plastic pollution? And, and what have you found to break down those plastics? Yeah, quite a range. I think that the first large project was the ones where we used the superworms. They're called superworms, uh, that's the common name, but they're actually insect larvae. They have six legs like insects do, and uh, they have very, very good mouth parts. So they're able to chew through the plastic and we gave them uh, polystyrene, polystyrene foam. After a few hours, they were just exploring and we had to leave them. So we went home and at this point, we didn't know if the superworms would eat the polystyrene and uh, dig into it. Came back the next day and uh, we went to the lab, we opened the boxes they're in, hear this crackling sound and see the worms eating their way into the polystyrene blocks. So that was, it was a great moment, definitely. Definitely a breakthrough moment, but we knew there was a lot of additional work ahead of us. Based on our research, it seems that the superworms and the gut microbes work together to degrade the plastic. What we found is that the worms could survive on polystyrene, and surprisingly, it even gained a little bit of weight. And that told us that they are able to, to get energy by eating polystyrene. We looked into the guts and into the microbes that are in the guts. And it seems that some of those microbes uh, indeed encode um, enzymes that are involved in the degradation of polystyrene. Uh, what we did is we, we wanted to see if they can actually go through the whole life cycle. So those are uh, larvae of the darkling beetle, so Phobos morio. And we followed up on that after we fed the polystyrene to those quote unquote worms, and they could still then become pupae and turn into beetles. Can you take me through the origin story of how you got to these superworms? Like, how did you determine that you were going to look at them in the first place? How did you do that research? Yeah, that, that happened a few years ago. And I don't know if your listeners are aware, but it was a paper originally about wax worms. And there was some evidence that wax worms could uh, chew small holes into another plastic, polyethylene. And we looked at that and said, well, I think there's more to it and there must be other insect larvae that might also be able to degrade plastic. And we didn't know if it's going to work when we started the experiment, but we, we thought about the superworms, which you can get here in Australia. They're mo mostly used for pet food, actually. If you have reptiles, that's a very nutritious food. 
In other countries, um, they are also used for human consumption. So it's it's possible. You, you can order chocolate-covered superworms online. <laughs> yeah, I used to actually have a gecko, and I would feed the gecko uh, these superworms, or uh, kingworms, I think, was another name for a, another group of them. And at one point, I left them for too long, and they did, in fact, move on to their next life stage. <laughs> oh, <laughs> They were no okay. longer worms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, they tend to do that. I mean, they have... They have a high fat content, also a protein content. So they are actually a very healthy snack for animals and yeah, also humans, I guess. <laughs> That's right. Though technically dubbed superworms, these larval beetles are frequently found in pet stores where they're a meal for pets. And sometimes, yes, they can even be fancied up with a little bit of chocolate as a tasty delicacy. These little guys are super helpful. Just think about all the holiday wrapping and plastics that could be chewed away each year. Like helpful little festive wormy elves. Happy holidays, everyone. <laughs> so could these insect larvae with their crunching mouth parts eat their way through the issue? What kind of additional work were you already envisioning that you'd have to do? What we did in our research is we inferred some enzymes uh, in the in the microbes in the gut of the superworms, right? And we found some genes for enzymes that are involved in the degradation of polystyrene. But the next step is we have to we have to verify the function. So there are probably more enzymes involved in, in it. And the best way to do this is to enrich all the microbes so we can have them in the lab. And then we can do a range of experiments. We can silence and knock out certain genes and see which, which genes encode which enzymes and which functions are those. Once you've identified those enzymes and their function, is it feasible that you could essentially sprinkle them all over a, a whole bunch of polystyrene? Like, could you get rid of the worm as the middle worm? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's exactly what we're planning to do. Because, I mean, in theory, we could have like gigantic worm farms, right? But I don't think that scales very well. Worm farms do sound both incredible and terrifying. Yeah, I can see that. But our goal is to really learn as much as we can from the system. And then, as you said, create like an artificial superworm, if you will, right? Grow the microbes to extract the enzymes. And then, yes, if you will, like sprinkle the enzymes or incubate the plastic, the shredded plastic with the enzymes. And that way we have way more control over the process. Right. I'm sort of imagining creating like a compactor that is like a superworm gut <laughs> where those enzymes can survive. Yeah, yeah, similar. Usually we use like big like batch reactors where we have the exact optimal conditions, like the right temperature, the right pH for those uh, enzymes to work. And that way we can really control the process much better than, you know, in, in a superworm in an animal. So I think those are really interesting systems to study. And we're definitely going to do that to also um, have a few other insect um, species in our lab and see what they can degrade. And then again, I guess the long-term goal would be to use all that knowledge, right? And then have an artificial system where we can incorporate everything we learned from those, uh, from those insect larvae. Chris and his colleagues can scale up the ability to break down harmful pollutants by zooming down into the gut of larvae with a genomics lens. Because Chris has spent a lot of time thinking about how to remedy some of the wrongs we've inflicted through plastic pollution, I was also curious about his view of the climate crisis. Does this research make him optimistic? Well, and when we sort of think of scale and scope, I'd love to take a step back and ask you about the scope of this issue. I mean, what are we currently facing when it comes to plastics and these forever chemicals in our environment? Yeah, it's 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 pretty sad if you think about it. We are producing a lot of plastic and the latest statistics say it's about 350 million tons of plastic a year in a single year. And even more depressing is if you look at the plastic production over the last you know decade, it's going up, up, up. So there are predictions that by the year 2050, Worldwide, we're producing about a billion tons of plastic in a single year, right? So that's that's a really, really large number. And the problem is that uh, plastic recycling is really lagging behind. And if you look at the percentage, actually, the percentage of plastic recycling is going down because, you know, we're not recycling much more, but the production increases like crazy. So it's definitely a big issue. And yes, coming back to what we said at the beginning, right? There is a lot of a lot of this plastic um, goes into landfills or it escapes into the environment, 
goes into rivers and then, sadly enough, ends up in the ocean at some point. Like, what is the life cycle of plastics in our environment? What happens to them? Yeah, what usually happens is the plastic that escapes in the environment, right? It can escape from landfills or because it's just thrown out. It uh, usually, most of it ends up in rivers and then eventually in the ocean. And plastic, plastic does break down. Big pieces break apart within, you know, a few years, but then we have a lot of microplastics in the ocean that stays there for a long time. And some of that, um, there's some studies out there showing that it might sink to the bottom of the ocean. So, um, and it obviously is washed up on beaches or islands. So that's why we have plastic pretty much everywhere. It's, it's very um, recalcitrant to degradation in the environment. A lot of the plastic, unfortunately, is single-use plastic, right? And I think that's that's probably the craziest part of it all. So you you produce plastic from petroleum, you use it once, and then it goes already to waste. So that is probably the way the most wasteful part. There are other plastics that are used a bit longer, right? But they also become plastic waste eventually. So I don't know about Canada, but Australia, for example, is doing not very well. We we recover only about uh, less than twelve percent of our plastic. So there's there's a lot of work to do. What do you think is the biggest threat we face to preserving this planet that we have? With all the threats that we're facing, what do you think is the biggest one? I would say it's it's probably climate change, right? That's going to have a really, really huge impact on all of us on our planet, right? And um, some of those some of those problems that we face, those man-made problems are, are connected more or less. Because, you know, even if you go back to the plastic problem, we, we have a lot of oil reserves, we take those, we, we use them to make plastic, single use, right? Some of that, some of that is, um, is burned, turns into CO2, right? Not very good also. A lot of that goes into the environment. So I think we have to probably rethink a lot of our strategies and, and our use of plastic um, is probably one of them. And that relates to climate change, which is probably one of the biggest issues there is right now. And I know you touched on it earlier, but when we're thinking about the use of these worms, we're not saying we're going to release millions of these insect larvae into the environment. We're talking about using them in a closed system. We're harnessing these enzymes that they have in their guts. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. So no, we don't want to release any any larvae into the environment, right? It's all in a closed system. So we won't end up with any tremors-like situation where the worms have... Must be a million of them! You know, <laughs> they're like sandworms now. <laughs> no, 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 nothing, nothing like that. I mean, you know, here in Australia, we have a lot of those ice boxes. They're made out of polystyrene and people were afraid, oh, the worms are going to eat them. And no, no, no. We have the worms in here, um, in the lab, and that's where they are. And there are no plans to release any worms or microbes. So there's, there's no danger of that. What I love about this story is how hope can be found in really unexpected places including in the gut of a beetle larva. So if that's any indication, the odd spaces where microbes can be found can sometimes be hard to get to. In fact, you may even have to dive into unchartered territory. Here we go, here we go. The diver you're hearing is Dale Anderson. He works with Aria to find microbes we're less familiar with. Dale Anderson is uh, an exceptional scientist. He has done a lot of the pioneering work in Antarctica. So what you heard is Antarctica is hard to get to. So you really need to take these helicopters in and land. And then you want to dive and sample things in the water. So there's all these big stromatolites and growths in these largely closed systems that are capped with ice. And so what you hear is then diving under the ice in these really frigid conditions and then collecting those samples. By diving down into these icy waters, Dale is unlocking century-old secrets about our natural world. Secrets that could be the key to knowing more about our planet's past and future. Is Dale down there collecting microbes? Yeah, absolutely. So he's collecting 
water samples, and then we would look at the microbes within that. And so he'll collect them from different depths, uh, sediment at the bottom of these lakes. And so we talk a lot about, well, it depends, I guess, on who your dinner guests are. Mm -hmm. In my world, we talk a lot about these biobanks. And so going to these places where it's this sediment that has been undisturbed for so long, and it's a closed system, and collecting microbes from there is really this like historical bank of microbes and DNA and history that we can learn a lot from, a lot about ourselves and this planet and changes this planet has gone through and how quickly those changes happened and what we might be able to do to slow those changes such that it's not so painful for us to be a part of them. How do these microbes survive in these extreme environments? One of the things I think to first put into context is that life and death with microbes this is now getting philosophical. We're going from gross to philosophical. <laughs> but life and death, there are microbes that can be dormant and completely inactive and they haven't done anything. They are essentially dead until thousands or tens of thousands or longer of years later, you bring them up to the surface or to an environment where they're able to kind of Frankenstein's monster. They come back. Yeah, so, you know, you can create these, like, fat layers that don't freeze at, at these temperatures to protect the, the insides of that cell from freezing. So we, we dive down. We get really chilly for a bit. And we bring these microbes to the surface. What do we learn from them? We learn about the bounds of life on this planet. And as we get more extreme, because one of the things, global warming, yes, the average temperature overall increases, but you also get these more extremes in weather. So colder colds and hotter hots. And we're using this type of information to understand what are the true limits of life on this planet? And then what can we learn from that in terms of strategies, metabolisms, and technologies that we might want to create and adapt so that we're more comfortable and, and can survive uh, on, on the planet. Yeah, right. So, so how do we use them before we get to our limit, essentially? Exactly, exactly. Because we have those trillions of cells and we have really strict limits and microbes don't. And so we want to look at them and say, okay, what are the bounds? What are the hottest hots and coldest colds that life can live on? What do you envision then for using microbes to both prepare for the climate future and repair what's already happened. I would love to see microbial standards for reclamation. So we're like, you know, it doesn't, you know, what are, we want the right microbes to be in the environment because we know if those are there, everything else will get taken care of. They're this base fundamental level of ecosystem. And if we can start to get those in place, the trees and the birds and the bugs and the fruit will grow, right? Like that's that's fine. So we're we're I think we're often trying to take this top down approach instead of establish this as a as a as the fundamental layer. So we would love to see microbes normalized in that way, where we're using them foundationally. It sounds like including them as part of like biodiversity estimates. When you go into a habitat and look at what's there, you're actually also looking at the things you can't see. Yes, like let's look at those. I, I think that there's probably what we're going to see is like microbes being productized where it's like, oh, this is an alternative to fossil fuel based fertilizers. We need that. So we're going to have to find solutions that I think are probably microbial based to start to enhance crops and plants to start to improve yields, uh, decrease pests and other viruses. I hope that we're getting to the place on mine sites where we're able to get more things extracted. So we've we've tapped out a lot on like high quality deposits where it's really easy to get the gold out or the copper out or whatever it is and now we're in these lower quality deposits where it's like it's trickier it's mixed in with things and i think microbes are going to help us get that out we need to get those metals out because we need to be able to electrify the grid we need batteries we we need wind power we're going to need a combination of these things and we can't do them without microbes so i think i'm hoping to see microbes really like inserted in all of these places. You're going to get a microbial test for your health. We're going to do microbial tests to figure out what should be built here and when and where crops should be rotated. And my dream would be that we see microbes everywhere. It's like super normal. Aria, it's been an absolute delight to geek out with you on the gross and the philosophical. Thanks so much for taking the time to chat today. Super fun. Thanks for having me. Climate change isn't the cheeriest topic, 
its enormity and pervasiveness can be overwhelming. But there are lots of people and critters doing amazing work to help fight this crisis. Superworms and microbes are only a few of the -the out-of-the-box examples of how we can repair some of what has already been broken. Obviously, the answer to the question, can we save our planet, isn't a straightforward one. The planet's not going anywhere. I mean, well, until the sun swallows it. But our actions are going to determine what our future world will look like. As we heard from Arya and Chris, preserving the species and environments we have today is going to take a multifaceted approach from economies and scientific advancements around the world. There's no one single solution, but lots of actions. We can all lessen our carbon footprint, but big change also needs to happen higher up from the entities of power who make big decisions. And I'm not just talking about deciding to go to Mars. My guests for today have been Arya Han, CEO and founder of Kunki, and Dr. Chris Rinke from the University of Queensland. Also, a special thanks to Dale Anderson for capturing a few of the sounds of their incredible work. And finally, thank you to all the folks who contributed their voices on this episode and shared their thoughts on our climate future. You've been listening to Nice Genes, a podcast brought to you by Genome British Columbia. If you liked this episode, go check out some of our previous ones wherever you listen from and share this earworm with your friends. You can also DM the show on Twitter by going to at GenomeBC. We also have learn along activity sheets added to the show description. That's it for season two of Nice Jeans. I want to thank all of the people who shared their stories with us this season. All right, I'm ready to go. (laughs) (laughs) Having these really strong connections that humans also have had for thousands of years with each other and actually do have an environmental impact. The number one thing we need to do is tackle climate change. Who better to see what are the facts than the people who live out here? It has to be a fundamental shift in how we're living. Who (laughs) better than me? Tack, det är bara bra. Are you speaking Swedish? (laughs) one of the most spectacular stories in all of evolution. Obviously, I'm biased. We definitely have our work cut out for us, but we are very excited doing those next steps. The boundaries that we're pushing are going to have an enormous benefits to society as a whole. I really, truly believe that. I already have some thoughts. Yeah. So you can stop me if I shouldn't have these thoughts right no, now. No, you should have thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I get out of coffee and, and ponder, what does this all mean? We would have never known that there were these hybrids out there. We didn't ask and we weren't curious Think about what we were able to do and what we could achieve if we had that kind of knowledge for everything. You know, really knowing that there's a real chance to to make an impact right now was sort of like the thing that tied it all together for me. Thank you for working to build a more sustainable future. And very importantly, I want to thank the team behind Nice Jeans. Our producers are Sean Holden and Phoebe Melvin. For sound design and our audio technician, Patrick Emile. Project lead is Mandy Elcaray. Marketing is Matthew Stevens and Marjorie Henderson. Audience growth is Christy Bolton. Our interns this season are Jenny Cunningham and Ollie Nicholas. And our chief creative officer is Jen Moss. And of course, thank you for listening. We really appreciate you joining us on this genomic journey. So here's our final audio applause to celebrate you. And hey, if you've enjoyed the stories we've shared with you so far, leave us a review. Like, share, all that fun stuff, wherever you listen from. It actually goes a long way in helping us continue this podcast. For now, thanks for listening. <laughs>